Hebrew language, although it's very exotic here and nobody hears that much, um, is not a barrier between the Uyghur community and the Canadian audience because uh, sound doesn't have any barriers and I think, you know, when you talk about love uh, in any language, um, through the music it becomes very clear and um, I think uh, because the Canadian audience is so multicultural and has so many experience uh, with different people from different parts of the world, they actually learned very well how to understand uh, the language of the other. One of the remarkable facts in the history of the Uyghurs, which left a deep mark on their culture, is that throughout their existence they have professed most of the world's major religions. They have practiced shamanism, Buddhism, Manichaeism, and Nestorian Christianity. In the 9th century, Islam has been introduced to the Uyghurs throughout different mystical sects, most notably the Sufis. Gradually, by the 14th century, Islam replaced all other religions. Muslims, however, have allowed all other religions to coexist in an atmosphere of exceptional tolerance, which was a great influence on the Uyghur culture. Dance was considered a medium to express devotion. It was commonly practiced in religious contexts, especially in the Sufi ritual of Sema, in which the mystics turn both around their own axis and around one another, representing the earth revolving on its own axis while orbiting the sun, or possibly God. The Uyghurs follow the Naqshbandi Sufi order, which does not include the whirling dance in its rituals. Instead, they listen to the divine rhythm created by their breathing, azan, which is a call for prayer, and a recitation of the Holy Quran's verses. Uyghur culture, which dominated Central Asia for more than 1,000 years, went into a steep decline after the Manchu invasion in eastern Turkestan in 1759, and later under the rule of the nationalists. Beijing has placed a nuclear testing area in eastern Turkestan. 41 nuclear tests have been made since 1964 in Lobnar. Of course there are songs about history and this is a very important uh, body of songs that are, is unfortunately um, not permitted to perform in East Turkestan. A particular one is uh, actually Zohra Janim, um, which is about uh, uh, one man who has been um, uh, taken by um, Chinese uh, authorities and uh, he's about to die and the night before his death he's singing uh, or sending a, a sound message or song message to his beloved and, and talks about his love and of course to, uh, that, that the love that is related to the love of the, of, to the motherland and uh, of course a woman represents the motherland. Since for the last three centuries, the Uyghurs were subject to continuous attacks on their political and cultural identity, they have created a huge repertoire of songs, called Dastans, with texts based on historical events or about the heroes and heroines known to any Uyghur person. Great historical names such as Ipar Khan, Nazugum, Sadir Palvan, and Say Noshi, persons who sacrificed their lives in the struggle for freedom, were immortalized in these songs. To raise the patriotic conscience and to create a heroic character with whom any Uyghur can identify, all texts of historical dastans are written in the first person. Thus, each time when a performer sings a dastan, the past of the Uyghurs is recreated. 
The performer himself, by singing in the first person, lives and experiences the life of a hero or a heroine. Furthermore, this identification of the performers with the heroes creates a new connotation. The dasnan is no longer perceived as an event of the remote past, but rather a recent reality as told by a real performer hero. Uyghurs have many different representations and this is linked to, um, to the country in which they are represented. Well, because most of the Uyghurs live in East Turkestan or part of China, Chinese are representing Uyghurs as um, very exotic, um, very lively and happy about their um, political situation. And uh, also they are sexualized um, and dramatized at the same time, um, uh, and this representation I don't find particularly true, but unfortunately it's so popular that it became, you know, a, a sign of the Uyghurs, and any time you watch uh, Chinese TV, um, you al always see uh, Uyghurs dancing and, and, and happily singing, and uh, always like half naked. Well, un unfortunately, um, uh, many researchers who didn't have much experience with Uyghurs, uh, picking up those stereotypes and um, continuing talking about Uyghurs as, as a very happy and um, um, life-loving people. It's true they are happy, like they are life-loving, <laughs> but it's not that they are happy uh, that much about the uh, present situation and uh, in fact uh, many people don't understand the irony of the, of the many songs that are talking about love and uh, uh, in fact talking about love to the motherland and those songs are usually in the essence uh, very sad although they're using you know major mode which in the western world is associated with, uh, with the happy feelings but you know you have to understand the whole context of the music and, and culture.